Hello everybody and welcome back to The Way That I See It. My name is Lucy Superfox and this is my podcast. So today <clears throat> I wanted to share with you a little bit about um, self-love in the season that you are in. This is a topic I was asked to train on at the weekend at an empowerment event and it was a topic that I would never have picked for myself. It's not something that I would have thought, yeah, I know how to talk about that. I know how to share about that, but it really when I wrote it and I wrote it on the plane on the way there, like it really resonated with me on so many levels because I hadn't realized how, what I had done, how, how I had built my life, how, how I created the next levels of wealth, the next levels of business, the next level of whatever, how I had created that through, from a place of self-love. And so what I wanted to share with you tonight is, is some of those key points, right? So share with you some of those things from the training that I did in the hope that there'll be something with it that resonates with you, something in it that you take away and go, holy shit, like this is everything I needed to hear right now. I'm going to go do that. So first of all, I think it's really good to get clear on like what self-love is and what self-love isn't. And I think there's a million definitions out there. But for me, self-love is doing what you need to do to be your best self, right? It is not about bubble baths and candles and you know, if that is part of your enjoyment in life, amazing. But my definition of self-love is doing what you need to do to be your best self. And self-indulgence or self-soothing is doing what you need to do to feel better in the moment. And I think, you know, most of us have been soothing our way through life. Most of us from a young age and we've hurt ourselves or had a bad day have been taught to soothe ourselves rather than, you know, face and run, you know, face them. We've been taught to run away from painful emotions and experiences. And the challenge is because of that behavior, we then do that with challenging and emotional experiences that we need to feel like going to the gym at 5 a.m right so this constant need to self-soothe this constant craving for self-soothing is basically teaching us and we're reinforcing this that anything other than joy and comfort are bad and that also keeps us running and soothing but instead of that what self-love really is and this is everything I talk about on this podcast and everything I talk about all the time is self-love is first of all acknowledging accepting and owning what you want Number two, doing that inner work to believe that you can have it. Three, taking action towards your goals. And number four, trusting the process. Like if you aren't doing those things, you're not giving yourself the chance of being your best self. Like you're just not. But what I want to be really clear about is that when I talk about those things, it's not that self-love is constant striving for achievement, right? And that constant sense of that exhausting sense of overachievement. Like that's not what it's about. I'm talking about self-love is not settling for a life less than you desire, less than you want, or less than you deserve. You know, we can follow that process, identify what you want, do the work to change your beliefs, take the action, trust the process. In every single season of our life, whether the season that we're going through is shit, whether the season we're going through is great, whether what we're is happening to us is ideal or not so ideal. So I'm going to share a couple of seasons with you um, from my life. Hopefully they'll be relatable. You know, and I absolutely love Friends. I love the series, series Friends. It's moving the ring light. Um, I love the series Friends. And so I called these the one where. And if you don't like Friends, well, I'm not sure we can be friends. because I just don't know if I trust people who don't like Friends. I'm like, it's funny and it's real. Maybe they're just not middle-aged yet. Maybe that's what it is. Um, on my way to 35. So thoroughly re-enjoying Friends reruns. But I digress. So some of the seasons of my life. I have called the one where. So the first kind of season, I guess, or the first episode that I wanted to talk about and touch on, and I will touch on these things lightly, you know, these podcasts are super short, is number one, the one where I lost myself with food. Now, my journey with food, my relationship with food started when I was 14 in my um, mid-teens, and I actually think it started before that. And there were two things that happened. One, I was desperate to control the life around me that felt out of my control. That was number one. I was always an overachiever. You know, my parents just left me to get on with things. I would always, you know, they'd know I'd revise. They didn't have to chase me to do things. I would always get things done. And I think that that sense of needing to prove something, that sense of overachievement, plus the sense of, you know, life's changing around you, 14, you know, your hormones are going crazy. You're like, you were like, boys, oh, I want to do that. Do I want to be that grown up? I'm not sure. You know, exams, stress, like all of those things made me use food as a mechanism for control. This really carried on, on and off in a kind of very much binge starve kind of cycle. And I want to be really, really clear here. I always referenced that I had disordered eating. I was never clinically diagnosed with any eating disorder. And I'm very careful about that. But this disordered or disrupted or dysregulated eating pattern, whatever you want to call it, carried on until I was in my, well, carried on for a long time, actually. But it kind of at, at its peak was when I was 20. So I went to university when I was 19 and I went away. And most people go to university in that first season. That's, you know, first term, they come back and they've, you know, gained about 20 pounds from drinking and eating crap. But mine was the opposite. 
it was pretty much a skeletal. I could see all the ribs through my back and I wasn't well. And it wasn't me that was called out on it. You know, I didn't call myself out on it. A friend of mine told my mum, she saw me get changed when we were going out and night out. And she was like, this is not okay. And I came home at Christmas to an intervention. And it was at that point that I kind of accepted that I had a problem. And the problem was, again, purely control. I was using food to control how I felt, to make me feel some sense of control in a world where I felt like I had none. I was in a relationship with somebody that... I cared about greatly and I wanted to be with, but was they were unsure of themselves, they were uncertain, they were in and out. And that sense of uncertainty left me wanting to find something certain and food will give you certainty, right? Self-soothing at its best. You know, mid twenties, this came back for a swing in vengeance with a binge eating disorder. And again, use that term lightly, never clinically diagnosed, but I can pretty much guarantee that if you're binge eating, it's disordered, <laughs> right? And so I was eating, you know, secret eating, hiding my food. I was blind binging, you know, I was doing all these things. And actually what it came down to, the thing that broke it, the thing that broke, and people always ask me this, what was it that changed? Is that I was on such a journey of self-discovery and personal development. I had been since I was about 24. But at some point it all compounded and added up. And at that moment that it added up, I reached a point where I liked myself. I knew myself, I trusted myself. I respected myself and food just became fuel. Like, I can't tell you, I can't pinpoint the moment where I said, I'm not going to binge anymore. Like, I just remember one day waking up and realized I hadn't binge for a long time. So, you know, I want to really stress that because I have used food, I've used alcohol, I've used many other things, you know, partying, sex, drugs, all of it, being truthful as ways to soothe myself from stressful situations, things that have been happening in life. I have run from a lot of things for a long time. And I really believe that one of the key things to moving forward in life and to be your best self is to stop running and to face what's really happening and to get really, really aware. And I'm going to talk more into that in a moment. But that for me was the thing that stopped it was not just knowing I was binge eating, but being really aware of why and what was happening and how I was trying to run from and how I was trying to feel and what I was seeking. And when I really recognized that compounded with personal growth, I was able to move past that Two, the one where I went to hell and back twice and I'm not going to get into this too much but um I went through toxic shock or a version of toxic shock you could argue in 2012 2013 I was very poorly for about four months we didn't know what was wrong with me in and out of hospital systemic infections allergies to antibiotics my liver was overloaded kidneys were overloaded gut health was terrible I looked like shit didn't work for four months couldn't really get out of bed skin was terribly itchy anyway long story short turned out that I had a breast implant rupture and I had the PIPs and these were the French ones that did not have human grade silicon in them they had mattress grade or tire grade silicon in them so no wonder I was very poorly my body was in a chemical state of shock and it was during this time that I you know as much as my life on paper looked fantastic I was quite honestly at this point in my life at breaking point and this was also the time just before I got sick my somebody I'd been with for seven and a half eight years at this point we decided to call time in our relationship for good. And it was the best thing to do. Like it was the best thing to do. But the challenge was that I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to let go of that relationship. And I really call this time the toxic time because not only was I suffering from obviously body toxicity, I was in a toxic addiction, trauma bonded cycle with this person where we couldn't leave each other alone. We're completely addicted to each other. You know, we'd spend three weeks apart knowing it was the right thing and then we'd end up back in bed and you're like, this is not the answer, right? And it was really during that time that I completely lost myself. I was probably the most broken and I've ever been in my entire life. I remember my housemate, and Becca, if you listen to this, I still love you to this day for this. You know, she could, she didn't leave me alone for a week because she was too scared to leave the house. And not, not because of anything like that, but because I was so uncertain and unsure of myself. And, you know, the loneliness would crush me. And, you know, to people to see me now, meet me now, they find that such an alien thing. And, you know, that wasn't even that long ago. You know, we're talking 2013. It's like nine years ago, which now I've said it out loud, sounds way longer, but that was a really toxic time in my life. And it was definitely what I'd call hell. And I was honestly a broken woman. And it was around this time that I really threw myself into personal development and personal growth. And this is where the personal journey started, the personal journey of self-discovery, of self, self-trust. self and, and this went on for a long time. You know, this wasn't something that overnight I read a book, did a course and I was finished. Like, I think that's an illusion that we live in is that you can 
heal traumas of your past with a one-time thing. That's just not how it works. You don't complete 12 weeks of therapy and go, lovely, thanks very much, I'm done, right? That's not how this works. Growth is never ending, but this toxic time was the first time I went to hell. And the second time is when I went through my divorce. And some people might be surprised by that because outwardly, I think that I carried on very publicly. I carried on. And I think most people underestimated how, what happens behind the scenes when you end a relationship, what happens behind the scenes when you end a marriage, no matter how long you've been married, and what happens behind the scenes when you aren't with somebody that you thought you were going to be with forever, regardless of who you're with then. So, you know, we were both in relationships with other people when we got divorced, but that didn't make it easier for either of us, I'm sure, and it certainly didn't make it easier for me although I was the one that instigated the decision I know that over the long term we mutually felt the same way that was a hellish time and I think anybody who's been through a very difficult relationship breakup or anybody that's putting off a relationship breakup is likely putting it off because of that very feeling the feeling of grieving for someone even though you know being together isn't the right thing and grieving for a relationship and a time in your life that you thought things would be different and Grief for anything is no different. And that's why I call that when I went to Helen back. So on a slightly more empowering note, three, the one where I realized this wasn't it. So in 2016, I walked away from my corporate career. This is a you know a public story that I share all the time. I just knew that as much as I love what I did as a job, I loved the, the value and what I delivered. I didn't love the corporate bullshit. I didn't love being told when I could and couldn't work, when I could go on holiday, you know, who else was off in the team. I didn't like being told I couldn't work from home. Like I know a lot of that has changed now in the corporate working world, but at the time I literally said, fuck this and left. <laughs> and that was that to build my, obviously to build Team Superbox, which I then went on to do for five years. And then in kind of the end of 2020, early 20, it was end of 2020. So yeah, yeah, five years. I've been building business a couple of, couple of months before I left. Um, in 2020, I made the decision to actually close Team Superbox to pass on my clients to other people. And that was because I was reached a place myself where I was so, I was feeling, and I hate the word balance, but I'd found this, this place where I could have a glass of wine on the weekend, I could have lunch out, and that wouldn't affect my relationship with food. I could go to the gym three times a week, feel good for that, but not need to push myself anymore, you know? And when I'd reached that place, then coaching people for a competition for prep, for that extremity, I found it really challenging. And I think obviously I'd come out of a six month trying to coach my clients through a six month lockdown as well, I think. So the extra stress of that. And, you know, I was in a fortunate position. I'd built my network marketing business to a place where financially I had some stability and some security. And, you know, I'm always, and this is why I believe in multiple income streams, right? So that you can always make choices. It's not because you're not happy right now. I, when I left my corporate job to my coaching, I was like, I'm gonna do this forever. Five years later, I changed my mind. Like you have the right to fucking change your mind, but you also need to be that person that takes responsibility for building plan C and plan B. So in 2020, you know, the one where I realized this wasn't it, I decided that wasn't it. I wanted to walk away from that and move more into the mindset coaching solely, build my network marketing business and continue to do some other stuff. And then in 2021, I think the biggest thing for me that I realized wasn't it was my search for outward validation. It ended my need for recognition, my need for people to be to see me, my need for that, my need for likes, my need to go viral, my need to all of that crap that we go through. I didn't fucking need it anymore. And I will tell you that that is the most liberating experience of my life. And then finally, the one where I knew I was wildly capable and, you know, it speaks for itself when I left corporate, when I scaled my businesses and when I realized I was in love with my current partner, Josh, I just knew I could do it. And those seasons of my life are confusing, lost, dark, and they're also empowering and they're also transformative. And every season that we go through in life has that. Every season in life has the ability to be both darkness and light. And it's about recognizing that. And it's not about recognizing in the moment of your pain to try and, you know, to try and go, oh, well, actually, this could be good for me in the future. It's just about knowing that the season will pass and that just like we have here, you know, we have spring summer, autumn, winter, that we will move into a new season. But what self-love was in those seasons wasn't bubble baths and candles. It was doing what I needed to do to be my best, most fulfilled self, no matter how much I wanted to soothe it all away. And as you saw, some of those seasons were led by soothing. 
but all of those seasons were like created the life I have today that every single one of those was necessary to be the person I am right now to have the life I have right now so there are four stages of growth that we go through we go through self-awareness then we go through self-discovery and development then we move to self-love and then we move into self-trust and actualization and I really wanted to share with you a little bit about what it feels like to reach that place of self-trust and the way I can describe it is this one day you're just good you do things because you can and you want to and not because you have to or because of the false belief that it means anything whether you do or you don't but just because you're genuinely good and you're not good because you've lowered your standards from great but because you're done with the roller coaster and you're just ready to enjoy the ride of life some of us you know including me have been afraid to be happy for so long waiting for the other shoe to drop or the bottom to fall out of life but you need you need both shoes right we don't give ourselves permission to be where we are because we're so terrified that life is going to happen. But when we deny ourselves the permission to just be where we are, we're constantly living in a state of not enoughness. But what we have to remember is the seasons of your life are self-created, self-attracted, self-determined. And the key to changing the season, to moving yourself through to the next one is taking ownership. So there are four core belief systems or lessons that have stuck with me when I wanted to change the season I'm in, I wanted to shift where I'm at. Number one is the past does not dictate the future unless you decide that it does. Like if you've been in a 10 year career, you know, someone says to you, at least I've been in this career for 10 years. I'm not going to tell them to stay for another 30 because they've done 10. That applies to everything in life. You know, everything we've done at this point is created the life that you've got right now. But that past does not dictate the future. What dictates the future is, is what you do next, right? And so many people are obsessed with their current results, but a great quote from James Clear that I reheard this weekend is, you need to be more obsessed with your current trajectory than your current results. So what we have to remember is that we're in control of what happens next, not in control of what's already happened. And this is where forgiveness and letting go comes in. There's an amazing quote from Oprah Winfrey, which is forgiveness is not, is not condoning behavior, but it's giving up the hope that the past can be any different. And that for me transformed the way I thought about my life because I didn't have to ruminate and think about things that I'd done or other people had done or things that had happened to me because I just had to accept that I couldn't change it. And more than anything, and this under this final point is that nothing in life that has happened to you that's negative is not your fault, but transforming through it is your responsibility. Number two, nobody will love you like you'll love you. Honestly, internal validation your va- the ability to validate, love, nurture, recognize, and accept yourself versus needing it from the outside will be transformational for you. When we are constantly seeking validation from the outside, from other people, from things going on in our life, what happens is we become a sum of the identities that we think people think we are. There's the great quote, and I can't remember who it's by, I'll try and quote it in the thing, is I'm not who I think I am. I'm not who you think I am. I'm who you think that I think that I am. And so much of the time, Our identity is formed by the life, the environment, the people that we have around us. And you will then, while you're always seeking external validation, you will never truly be yourself because you'll always be looking for other people to validate who you are. I said in the last point, but I think this is really relevant here. We have to take responsibility. So when good stuff happens, we're all willing to put our hands up and go, oh, I did that, I did that. But you also have to be willing in that moment to say, I did that when it's not so not so good, because what that enables you to do is take your power back. And thirdly, under this point is we attract what we are. So right now, if you're looking to attract a partner or friendship or other entrepreneurs to play a bigger game of life with, right, you attract what you are. So you can so focus on what you want. But if you're currently living a different reality, like if you're negative and judgmental and you want a partner that's kind to you, you're going to have to change the way you behave to be able to attract that next level person. Number three, intention matters because energy does not lie. Like the example I always give of this of energy is I could say, I love you. I love you, or I can go, I love you, right? Those three things mean very different things. And all I did was change my energy. So your intention matters when you do anything in life, whether it's building your business, whether it's speaking to your clients, whether it is being in having that quality time with your partner or your family, your friends or your kids, right? That is so important. The way that you do something is so much more important than what you do. And when you do that, when you do things with real intention and real energy, you'll feel present. And when you feel present, you'll feel like you've done the thing you said you were going to do, right? And when we do things with no intention and no energy, what we feel like is we've just ticked a box off a list. And I don't want to live my life ticking boxes. I don't know about you. The second reason that energy and intention matters is energy and vibration is real. You know, I've talked about the law of attraction. Likely if you're into personal development, you are, you know, somebody who 
already grasped this concept, but we are simply molecules vibrating on frequencies. And so when you are vibrating on a frequency of positivity, of joy, of love, of happiness, of abundance, of gratitude, you will attract more of that into your life. And three is self-belief creates your energy and vice versa. You can go out through every day doing the things you need to do, like I said, tick boxing, or you can go through every day believing in yourself, trusting and knowing that everything's working out for you. And that choice is yours. But when you do something with self-belief, you'll create more energy and that energy will fuel your self-belief. And it's a nice cycle and a great circle, but that's where your intention matters. And finally, dare to dream, believe and keep the faith. And I have this tattooed on my arm because miracles and magic happen all the time. That is a core belief that I live with. There are so many things in my life and so many stories. I've talked about some of them before in previous podcasts where miracles and magic have absolutely happened. And one of my favorite phrases and things to say is, of course it did. Of course it did. Because if you want to have big things happen in your life, you want quantum leaps to happen in your life, we will always get what we're available for. And so if you want big things and quantum leaps, you've got to be open to big things and quantum leaps. You will always get what you are available for. So if you believe that everything is hard and difficult and a struggle and everything is about baby steps, then that is what you will get. And if you believe you're available for quantum leaps, big jumps and exciting things to happen, that's what you will get. And look, the seasons of your life might be like mine. They might be a bit like, oh God, the one where... Or they might have followed a more traditional linear path. But the reality is that life is happening all day, every day. And change is always coming. Winter will always come in some form, right? And our mission in life isn't to be joyful all day, every day. But when life does come, when those things do happen, just to be able to handle it, to be prepared mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially, practically. Guys, I have every excuse to not be healthy, to not be successful, to not be wealthy, to not be in a great relationship, to not work out, right? I have so many stories I could tell you. I have a hypermobile spine. I went through toxic shock. I, you know, was heartbroken. I had a problem with food, like blah, 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 blah. But I don't let my past dictate my future. I'm loving on myself daily because my energy will never lie to me or anyone else. And I am always dreaming bigger and working on my beliefs and holding the faith because I truly believe that miracles and magic happen all the time. Whatever season you're in, like in life right now or what episode you're in, I hope that something I've shared with you in this podcast empowers you to love on yourself that little bit more and take that next step forward and take life to your next level. And I really hope that in your next season of darkness that you choose to see the light. Thanks so much for joining me on this week's podcast. This was the way that I see it and the seasons of self-love. So have the most beautiful week and I'll see you on the next episode.